Hello, everyone. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brenda. Welcome to Playwrights Under the Radar. I have a quick message to give. Um, this is para todos los que hablan español. Recuerden que contamos con interpretación oral simultánea. Pueden descargar eh, el app en su teléfono. Es Web Switcher Pro. Y la clave está en el MDA Virtual Hub. Si, if you're listening from the US or Canada or somewhere else around the world and you haven't registered for the conference, go to lmda.org and register and you will have available uh, two days of conference plus asynchronous content. That's all from my side. We go back to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Brenda. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are enjoying the LMDA conference so far. Uh, I'm Brian Moore, uh, he, him, his. I'm president-elect of the incoming president of LMDA, and I reside on the ancestral lands of the Pawnee and the Sioux, uh, presently known as Seward, Nebraska. Uh, thank you for attending this year's Playwrights Under the Radar session. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the Agency for the Performing Arts for sponsoring this session, and I also wanna thank HowlRound for live streaming this session so we could reach a wider audience. Uh, we created this session a few years ago in order to share and lift up our favorite playwrights and their work to a wider audience. Uh, using our Hot Topics format, our presenters will have a maximum of five minutes to share their playwright. Since we do have a full slate of presenters, we will keep them informed of their time limit and we will stop them if necessary. Uh, but they've been practicing, uh, so I'm hoping we won't have to cut anyone short this year. In case you want to follow along, the, the list of presenters and playwrights are on the conference hub, along with documents with additional information about some of these playwrights and the program with some contact information. Please note that many of these playwrights can be found on the New Play Exchange website. Finally, we welcome you all to participate through the Facebook comments or on Twitter with the hashtag uh, hashtag LMDA2020, where you can uh, share any thoughts or questions for our panelists, which we will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of their presentations. Um, or um, you are also invited to share the names of playwrights of your own who you think deserve a larger spotlight. We would love to, to, uh, to increase the list and spread the word as much as we can. I think that's it for my introduction. I wanna make sure I give as much time as possible uh, to our, our group. Uh, so we'll get started. Our first speaker is Catherine Balacci. Catherine. Thanks, Brian. Oh, right. So my name is Catherine Balacci and I am speaking today about my friend, collaborator and a very talented writer, uh, Vishesh Abiratne. Now I'm going to start with his bio because he puts uh, it into really clear, beautiful words. So I'm just going to dive right into it. Born and raised in Montreal, Vishesh holds a BFA in playwriting from Concordia University. He writes with a keen focus on black comedy and satire with occasional dips into the speculative genres of science fiction and fantasy. His mission as a playwright is twofold. One, to bridge the gap between what is commonly known as high culture and low culture. There is no place for snobbery based on genre. Any story is worth telling as long as it's told well. And two, to put brown people on stage in complex roles that defy stereotypes and in stories that are fun, fresh, intriguing, and weird. If you're looking for plays about arranged marriage and intergenerational family drama, you've come to the wrong place, friendo. So I think that bio gives you a good sense of what he's all about. Uh, Vishesh and I first connected on a play called Endlings, uh, which was a dystopian science fiction uh, piece. Uh, we first connected about the idea of science fiction on stage and how it's done, how it can be done. For now, he's actually put that aside uh, because when you're writing about a dystopia and perhaps living in a dystopia, it gets a little complicated. So he's changed his focus towards producing work that bolsters audiences to instigate social change through a mix of humor, satire, heart, and hope. Uh, and so I'd like to highlight two other pieces that uh, he's been working on and he's had some recent success with. Uh, the first is Indifference. It actually was uh, presented as a sh at a short play 
uh, sorry, presented at a short play festival last year and also Divide and Rule, which personally I would love to direct one day. It's a fantastic satire. Uh, that it had a public reading at Enfini Theatre in Montreal uh, last year. So he's had some recent success and some momentum that he uh, would like to build on, and I think uh, he deserves to build on. So I've included his email, and he's also found on the New Play Exchange uh, Network. Uh, thank you very much. That is all. Thank you, Catherine. All right, next will be Laura Butchie. Laura. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Laura Butchie, she, her, hers. And today I'm going to talk about uh, a playwright and friend of mine, Jonathan Alexandrados, They, Them, Theirs. Jonathan is a New York City based playwright who earned his MFA in playwriting at Queens College. And they have had plays produced at the New York Fringe Festival, the Pop Culture Association, and I'll be talking a little bit about his affinity for pop culture, the Last Frontier Conference, uh, the New Works Lab at Nashville Rep, the Abingdon Theater, and they're a member of the Queen's Writers Collective Mission to Ditmars, if you're familiar with it. Jonathan is also a huge fan of toys, both classic and current. They have an enormous collection and they have written articles on action figures and theater and pop culture and how all of these help them explore and articulate their non-binary identity. And identity is a big theme in a lot of their works. They also incorporate storytelling and toys into all of their classes as a professor. And that's actually how we met uh, adjuncting together and uh, their work spans a range of imaginative storytelling. The piece that I want to lead with is Jonathan's most recent play called Toys 101, The Last Class. And it's an interactive show that reveals how storytelling and toys and the dialogue created by performance and toys can help to build community and hope, as well as how these things helped them to explore their identity and can help others explore. Toys 101 is an interactive solo show that is set up as the last day of class at a conservative high school. And the actor essentially goes rogue on the last day of school, arriving in a comfortable non-binary ensemble rather than the required shirt and tie and uses their story of personal discovery to engage the students who are now the audience in an exploration of their own lives and identity. And when I saw the show live last year, each audience member received a folder with a writing prompt, uh, a small toy and a pencil and audience members had time to write and share during the interactive show. They also performed this show again since the pandemic began and this time on Facebook Live, which allowed to keep the interactive element and everyone watching could complete the writing prompt on the same toy, which was presented on the screen and the audience comments were chatted, of course, instead of uh, discussed verbally, but both formats were moving in different ways. And I, I really enjoyed the online format as a successful sort of online distance, but interactive piece, since it naturally engages the audience with the real-time connection, which I thought was an unusual and a successful way uh, to attempt to do to online theater that they used. There are other plays, Span a wide range of genres from biography to dark comedy. There's some fable and magical realism in their work and they have small casts often. Uh, a couple of examples are uh, Duck, which is an animal fable uh, about identity centered on the only duck living in Sheep's Meadow and how he deals with isolation and some marginalization and even abuse. Uh, and abuse is also a sort of a theme in their play Teeth which tells the story of a woman without a mouth whose husband is a plastic surgeon and gives her one, but is then not too pleased with what she has to say. They have a few other plays and you can find them all on the New Play Exchange. They also had their first solo play, which was more of a biography about their great grandmother's immigration to the US, which seemed pretty perfect. But then once they really sat down and started going through it with their grandmother, they learned a little bit more about the process. So I'd really encourage you to look at their work. It's uh, very interesting the way it explores identity and explores the use of things like toys mixed with storytelling. Some of the works involve dance or puppetry as well. 
in mixed media that is also sort of transferable to an online medium. And all of their works, uh, except for the most recent one, which is not there quite yet, can be viewed on the new Play Exchange. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. All right, next is Jen Plants. Jen. Hi, thanks, Brian. Um, I'm Jen Plants, she, her, hers. I am a guest on the ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk Nation, where I teach playwriting and performance studies and other things at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, but I am the least interesting thing that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I want to talk about Ashley Lauren Rogers. She, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. Ashley is a playwright, a stealth dramaturg, a critic, performance artist, a podcaster, a trans rights activist and sensitivity reader and educator and so much more. Her plays range from the one minute, just a toaster that somehow creates a fully realized existential crisis in just 60 seconds to her work in progress, a safer space, which is an exploration of a zombie apocalypse where the zombies mysteriously get better. Full of sharp humor, her work, much of which lends itself to sight-informed staging, always creates magical other worlds that somehow feel about who we are right now. This spring at UW-Madison, I taught a course called Women's Writing, Contemporary American Women Playwrights, where I had the opportunity to push back against binary distinctions of gender in questioning why women's writing was some kind of essential category in the first place. And one of the plays I selected for the course that I found through the New Play Exchange was Ashley's Pass Fail. It's an autobiographical solo show that examines, it, that examines the privilege of passing and while failure might sometimes be a better option. It's a deceivingly simple one act and it does what theater, what we want theater to do. It tells a story we haven't heard before in a way that invites new ways of making community. When theaters and universities shut down, I reached out to Ashley and offered her a modest stipend to do a Zoom Q&A with my class, hashtag pay all artists for their labor. Ashley responded instantly. And the very first time I spoke to her, I had one of those moments. I thought this is an artist, a natural collaborator, a fresh voice and a presence with enough creative energy and curiosity to fill up any space you might offer to her. Pass Fail exists as a fantastic work to anchor a residency at a university with Ashley at its helm. This residency could focus on playwriting, autobiographical storytelling, and a trans ethics of care. As for full length work, in partnership with Step One Theater Project, where Ashley is literary director, the New Jersey Institute of Technology was supposed to present the New Jersey premiere of her full length play, Chasing the Ghost, this upcoming season, but gestures vaguely to everything in the world right now. But in my limited time here, I wanna highlight her current work in progress, a safer space. This play takes off like a rocket, activating both your imagination and your sense of your actual material self. It's a big play with a big cast of characters that you can actually cast from people who actually live in your community instead of the folks who normally get to tell their stories on stage. It's a zombie story, but it doesn't feel campy, but it's still fun. And it explores both how to grieve and how to move forward at the same time. It's a play we need now. A Safer Space wants a home for development and a world premiere. And I urge you to read it as soon as possible on the new play exchange. And I happen to know a great director slash dramaturg who is very passionate about this play if you'd like to talk more. Ashley has also written a few plays specifically conceived for Zoom. And rather than remediating a stage play to the computer screen in the coming months, I urge you to look for work that is conceived for the forms of storytelling that exist now. A great place to start is Ashley's To Everything. It's a short conference call play, as she calls it, about a woman who wants to delete her old dead name Facebook account, but can't quite seem to bring herself to do it. She's also a podcaster 
And to get to know her, I recommend the Mrs. Doubtfire episode of her regular podcast, Is It Transphobic? As well as the Writing for Combat and Movement-Oriented Theater episode of The Right to Play. All of her work and more can be found on her website, ashleylaurenrogers.com, where she also links to her new Play Exchange profile. You are also welcome to reach out to me anytime to talk about her, as there's nothing I love more than talking about theater artists who are making a better future for what we do now. And one of those people is Ashley Lauren Rogers. Thanks so much for letting me talk about her. I will say that, uh, uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, I will say that Ashley's uh, email address or website, I should say, is on the program, which is located in the hub uh, for this session. All right, our next uh, person is Juliana Marchese. Juliana. Hi, I'm Juliana. I, um, she or hers are my pronouns, and I'm gonna be talking about Levy Jelks. Uh, Levy and I first met at Carnegie Mellon University uh, a few years ago, while I was pursuing my BFA, he was pursuing his MFA in playwriting. Uh, but I really got to know Levy when I took a special topics class called African American Drama. As a Black playwright, Levy taught a class of about eight students a wide variety of, of Black theater literature. And this class was really pivotal for me because as an undergrad, it was the first time that I had been exposed to Black theater in a really big way. I think that the knowledge of Black history and specifically the knowledge of Black theater history that I gained in this class has influenced the, the plays, the way I read plays to this day. Um, so I mention all of that because the playwright that I'm presenting has literally made me a better literary manager and human um, through my education. Uh, so let's talk about his plays. Uh, first, I want to talk about A is for Apron. I'm going to read a little bit of a blurb about it. Um, after death, Millie, an enslaved woman from the Civil War, and Violet, a maid from the swinging 60s, are forced to work in the underground and in the underworld laundromat for eternity by a mysterious presence named Mr. Ford. When a, when a video vixen named Jazzy joins the other world laundromat and the machines all break down, all three women grapple with the prospect of leaving their workplace behind. This world, the world of this play is a uh, purgatory where 400 years of black history is aggregated. Um, I've really loved this play for a long time. And uh, when the circumstances of the world allow us to gather in rooms together, uh, Red Theater will be producing A's for Aprons um, non-university world premiere. The other play that I wanna talk about is called Day of Saturn. Uh, Levy wrote this play immediately after graduating from Carnegie Mellon. Um, here's a little description. Achilles Jones works tirelessly to repair his rundown hardware store before his son Icarus comes home from college. His plans are complicated when he hires a volunteer to help him named Odysseus, a charismatic young man who smells like the ocean and has a history of drug, drug abuse. The secrets of Achilles' son and the truth about their relationship come to light. Uh, so Levy hasn't had a production of this play, but he has been a finalist for quite a few things, um, most notably uh, Kitchen Dog Theater. Um, he was a finalist for their New Works Festival and the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center um, for the, the National Playwrights Conference. Uh, I really love this play because I'm particularly fascinated by plays that take a compassionate approach to toxic masculinity. Uh, this is a play about a father who is trying to toughen his son uh, because he he knows what it's what what it takes to live in this world as a as a black man or boy um, and what he needs to survive. Uh, it is about that, and it is also about the, the process of toughening, causing its own kind of trauma. Um, Levy's plays are also extremely funny, um, but for that, you will have to read them um, because I'm running out of time. Uh, you can find his work on the new play exchange. Both of the, these plays are on there. 
uh, you can also reach out to me and I'll email the form to you. And I'm also happy to email introduce you to Levy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, our next person is Anne Marie Dittman. Anne Marie. Thank you. Um, I am uh, Anne Marie Dittman. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I uh, just uh, quickly like to acknowledge my privilege as a white, cisgender, able bodied female. Also, uh, I'm coming to you from Bloomington, Illinois which is the ancestral home of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, uh, Ottawa, Sauk, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi nations. Uh, these lands were the traditional territories of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their soul for survival and identity. I'm here today to talk to you um, about Heather McDonald. Uh, and her play, Masterpieces of the Oral and Intangible Heritage of Humanity. Um, I, uh, so, a soldier, a student, and an art conservationist walk into a museum and hear a rhinoceros. Sounds a lot like the setup for a joke, doesn't it? Uh, but believe me, the Masterpieces of the Oral and Intangible Heritage of Humanity is anything but a joke. Like most of Heather's work, the play explores the nature of humanity and inhumanity through intimate situations and stories revealed through encounters with art, religion, and nature. But we'll return to that in a moment. I know this session is called Under the Radar and my playwright uh, has had plays produced on Broadway, off Broadway, and regional productions. So this is really not so much under the radar as um, perhaps back on the radar. Um, Heather McDonald is a playwright, director, and teacher. Um, she's the writer in residence and professor of theater and film at George Mason University uh, at, in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, but after a hiatus of nearly, nearly a decade from playwriting, I'm very glad to reintroduce you to her work. Uh, I'd just also like to say that it's not uncommon, I think especially for female playwrights, women playwrights, um, that they start to get a little momentum in their careers. And then with the uh, primary caregiver roles along with juggling a bill paying career, they often uh, end up taking a, a little break from playwriting. And once that momentum is lost, it often takes <clears throat> a long time to gain uh, the time and the headspace uh, to do, to, to re-engage their careers and their writing. So I'm very glad uh, that Heather is back with us and again writing uh, with this powerful and prescient play uh, that very much deserves another production somewhere. Masterpiece of the Oral and Intangible History of Humanity was developed as part of the Arena Stage Cogard Cradle series and workshopped and produced at um, Signature Theater in Arlington, Virginia in 2019. Okay, civilization is about to collapse and you have 20 minutes to decide what to save. Doesn't sound quite so outrageous these days, does it? What do you take? Do you take the Rembrandt painting or the first crayon drawing that your child did? Do you take the Nina Simone recording or the mixtape that your first lover made for you? These are some of the questions at the heart of this play. Set in the ruins of a prison in a country that has been at war for a hundred years, give or take a day, three women from diverse backgrounds, a soldier, a student, and an art conservationist engage in a trenchant struggle to determine who or what is worth saving. It is simultaneously brutal and poignant full of emotional contrasts 
and shadows of light and mirrors the classical painting at the heart of the play. Perhaps the most striking element of this play is its examination of the dynamics of power and privilege and the way those dynamics shape, shape, change during times of cultural and political unrest. The women each navigate their assigned roles and relationships vis-a-vis -vis these relative positions of power and privilege, which have shifted throughout their lives and through the course of the play, eventually transcending them in unexpected ways. This disarming play features a diverse cast and allows the audience to find unexpected hope in the midst of chaos as the women dismantle the brutality imposed upon them to create solutions that meet each other and, the, and their need for survival. It explores many of today's most difficult issues with stark yet ultimately powerful voices. There's a lot to unpack in this play, but I hope you'll consider producing it and giving it a second life. I think it's worth saving. I'd also like to give a second quick shout out to another DC area playwright, Sujin Lee. Uh, Sujin earned an MFA in playwriting from the University of Texas at Austin. Another brilliant playwright in the category of slightly deferred momentum. I've been a fan of her work for about six years. Uh, her one act play, Peaches, was scheduled to be performed as part of this year's FemFest Houston Asian Voices at the beginning of June. But due to COVID, that was switched to a Zoom production. Uh, in this show, two 20 something best friends uh, on the uh, day of their friends, uh, mutual friends' wedding, uh, dissect their relationship as secrets and long lost, uh, long held frustrations are revealed. The lovely two-hander uh, that deals with, um, uh, deals with, uh, sorry, uh, interracial relationships, white privilege and parental expectations. Sujin's also uh, has a wonderful full length play, The Men My Mother Loved, um, which is really hilarious, uh, deserves a, a look. Her plays aren't on the new play, uh, new play exchange yet, but she's planning to put them up this summer. Uh, she's a high school English teacher, uh, and that is one of her projects for this summer. Um, also, though, there's an additional handout with some uh, production photos and a short video um, from Heather's play, which will be up on the Hub, along with contact information from both of these artists. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, we will get that information on the Hub um, shortly after the session. All right. Next up is Adeen Walker. Adeen. Hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you, Brian, uh, Martine, Brenda, and everyone at LMDA and HowlRound and APA. It's wonderful to be here with you all, and, and happy Juneteenth. Um, I'm thrilled to speak to you today about um, my dear friend uh, and collaborator, Yuong Wu. Uh, we first met last summer and we were brought together by the artistic director of the National Queer Theater, Adam Otes Rubin, who at the time was producing Yuong's play Joker as part of the theater's Criminal Queerness Festival. Adam told me that Yuong was developing a play about PrEP, the daily little blue pill that shields a body from contracting HIV AIDS. And he thought that Yuong and I should connect. We met up in the East Village at a coffee shop and Yuong ordered an acai bowl. And he told me that he always gets them because it reminds him of Hawaii. I asked if it was as good as the one he used to have there and he was honest and said, they never are. Over our conversation, I learned that prior to moving to New York City, Yuong grew up in China and later lived in Hawaii while getting his MFA in playwriting. Since last summer, we've been on a collaborative journey diving into the world of his new play titled The Prep Play or Blue Parachute. The kernel of inspiration for his play is a unique side effect of prep. The pill induces vivid dreams and nightmares. 
Oh, I'm getting a uh, comment about the audio. Oh. Let's see if this works. Um, thank you, Brenda. Um, the kernel of inspiration for his play is a unique side effect of prep. The pill induces vivid dreams and nightmares. It's common for many people on prep to experience surreal, scary, abstract stories while they sleep. This pill is intended to play a critical role in the eradication of HIV AIDS, as well as making it easier and safer for people, specifically LGBTQ plus people, to express our desires and our sexualities by being intimate without fears of acquiring what was deemed for a while as the gay plague. Yet as Jung explores in his play, Prep's unique side effect of bringing us intimate with our own subconsciousness through our dreams feels in some ways like our ancestors speaking to us and reminding us to acknowledge and never forget the collective trauma that has been handed down through the years and is indelibly etched into our bodies. Not just the inherited trauma from the 80s, but the years of persecution, repression, silence, suicide, depression, fear, and also the hidden unknowable stories of secret love and romance. While the little blue pill ushers in a new era for queer people, Yilong's play centering on PrEP's side effect urges this generation growing up post-DOMA, post-expanded understandings of on the basis of sex and post-PrEP to step inside the years of work and the lives lost that went into producing this little blue pill all through our dreams. I think as um, many of us know, stories about queer people play an incredibly important role in shaping political policy by literally teaching heterosexual people about queer experience. I've been thinking a lot recently about how when Joe Biden endorsed gay marriage in 2012, he cited the TV sitcom Will and Grace as the key work in our culture that educated him and the rest of America about queer people's lives. I think for many of us though, that was simultaneously a moment that affirmed the necessary activism for telling stories about underrepresented people. Yet it was also a collective moment for queer people to look around at each other and say, okay, what else can we get into the mainstream now? And more to the point, what stories can we get into the mainstream that also decenter the conversation of queer experience away from white cisgender men? Stories about queer people also uniquely shape how we see ourselves and our futures. These creative works and stories offer scripts to queer people searching for how to move through life, how to talk with our families about our lives, how to navigate healthcare, how to be endlessly creative in our sexual lives, how to know when a sexual experience was assault, how to build deep friendships, how to live long, full, healthy lives with HIV AIDS, how to adopt children, how to build a home and a future. Up until now, the dominant queer narrative was one that ended tragically early, often by violence, persecution, suicide, or illness. And in this way, queer stories being made today become how-to books because they are not necessarily transposed hetero scripts. Rather, they are uniquely foreign about the specificity of contemporary queer experience. Yulong is a critical voice whose plays delve into such specificity with a poetry and a heart that also celebrates the transformative wonder of live theater. His stories are urgent and necessary for a moment right now as we not only learn to live in a new era when LGBTQ plus rights are finally being recognized as human rights, but also in this new era of working actively every day to dismantle systems that protect white supremacy both inside and outside of the arts. Yulong's stories, I believe, are crucial for shaping our culture and thereby shaping how lawmakers will continue to learn how and why to protect queer people, and specifically those who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as those who are transgender and non-binary. Yulong is a necessary voice for paving our way for envisioning and building a collective future. And as I've spent time living in his mind and the world he engenders on the page, I've come to realize that a thread in his work centers around how queer people learn to build a home. And for Yulong's work, this can sometimes literally take the form of characters installing Alexa or figuring out the logistics uh, around social security. He often jokes that the sexiest thing about someone sometimes is that they have a 401k. But also for Yulong's work, the process of building a home can take forms through quotidian rituals that manifest homes through memory like ordering acai bowls and always expecting them, maybe even hoping that they'll never be as good as the ones in Hawaii. So I hope you'll reach out to him and read his plays and get to know his work, his website's on the program. And if you have any questions, thoughts or ideas, please reach out to me directly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adine. Um, again, Yilong's work, um, more information is on the conference hub. So please feel free to check that out. All right, next up is Susanna Bazillion. Susanna. Thank you. 
I hope you can all see this. Um, hello, I'm Susanna Bazoyan, and I'm pleased to introduce to you the head of Brigham Young University's playwriting program, George D. Nelson. Um, George is an award-winning playwright, director, teacher, and author, as well as entrepreneur and sought after lecturer, speaker, trainer, and adjudicator. Today, I will only touch on George's playwriting activities over the last five years, beginning with George's 2015 musical, Single Wide. It ran off-Broadway to sold out crowds, making it into Hyba Bull's top 10 picks for that year. Single Wide is a tender story that reviewer Matthew Murray says treats trailer park residents as actual human beings. Single Wide was back again in 2018 as part of BYU's main stage lineup. Sarah Harris of the Daily Herald said that Single Wide gives voice to the inadequate, echoing Irving's comments from Hyperbole that said the show was a revelation and an incredibly sweet and sincere story. George was a recipient of the 2015 Blanche and Irving Laurie Musical Theater Award. Later in 2017, George was named a playwriting fellow at the O'Neill Theater Center. George's short play, Talos, was featured in the 2017 William Ng Festival. It's about two anti-terrorists who decide to summon productive powers by awakening Greek mythology's Talos. Rachel Carnes in the New Play Exchange describes the show as creatively cinematic and that Nelson has a gift for evocative dialogue and powerful conflict. George's play, In Exchange, has been accepted into the 2020 Athens New Play Festival. It is about an actress who realizes too late that the price she paid for a modicum of success in her art form cost her what was most important in life. Finally, George is scheduled to run the world premiere of his latest show, 1820, The Musical. The show is centered in the true love story of Emma and Joseph Smith, the couple at the center of the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the primary victims of a political conspiracy that ended Joseph's life. It speaks to kindness, compassion, freedom, and denounces bigotry. The portrayals of humor, sorrow, and love are inspiring. It encapsulates common characteristics of George's work. These are digging deep into questions that satisfy and challenge the viewer's intellect, spirituality, and humanity. George knows how to assemble a team. He works very closely with Shelley Graham, BYU's professor for dramaturgy, who many of you know. Shelley says George is a phenomenal writer who trusts himself, takes risks, is inventive, is willing to play, asks questions, explores multiple paths for a character, and who treats his dramaturgs like a true partner. The low siblings, Kaylee Ann, Doug, and Kendra, the songwriters for 1820, the musical, echoed much of what she, Shelley said and added that George wants to give people a moving human experience that they can relate to. Now I will share my observations. George consistently expresses the belief that in this crazy world, playwrights can be the change and do it well. To this end, I have observed he has developed the skills of understanding story and structure, clear, creating clear and complex characters, effectively using visuals for storytelling. Regarding plot, he understands how to plunk an audience immediately into the action and then continue propelling them forward in the story while delving into the depths of human feeling, conflict, and expression. To find out more, please access one feet sheet for George Nelson. There you will find his email and links to additional information. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks for listening and enjoy this promo clip from 1820, the musical. I'll have that going for you in just a moment. Here we go.
Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. All right. Our next presenter is actually one of my first mentors in dramaturgy, <laughs> Art Barreca. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, um, sorry. See, I'm doing just as I do in the classroom. I'm stumbling around in my uh, with my technology. Um, there we go. All right, I'm talking uh, today about Ikram Basra. Um, oh, my, pr my pr pronouns are he, him, his. I'm Art Bereka. I am co-head of uh, the MFA Playwriting and Dramaturgy programs at the University of Iowa. Um, and uh, uh, they are also known together as uh, the Iowa Playwrights Workshop. Um, I am coming from Coralville, Iowa, next door to Iowa City on the ancestral lands of the Iowa, the Illini, uh, the Meskwaki, and the Sauk, among other Native American um, groups. I'm talking today about Ikram Basra, who is a well-established um, uh, poet, um, especially in Pakistan and among uh, lovers of Urdu poetry. Um, and he is now developing as a playwright with us uh, in the Iowa Playwrights Workshop where he is entering his second year in the program. I'm beginning with these photos because they're evocative of uh, some border cro crossings that Ikram and his work represent. Um, he was a news reporter and producer um, in Pakistan for Pakistan TV. And um, he uh, moved into, uh, uh, writing uh, poetry more and more, and now playwriting. Um, and uh, he has endured the literal border crossing uh, numerous times of going from Pakistan to the US and being uh, strip searched and undergoing eight hour interrogations. Um, he just recently finalized his status as a US citizen and is hoping that that will come to an end as he goes back and forth between his native country and his adopted land. Um, he is also uh, crossing over from witnessing as a TV producer in Pakistan and reporter, uh, many horrific events and uh, now being a dramatist, representing and reflecting on these events. And as a writer, he's been crossing over from writing primarily poetry in Urdu um, and uh, writing now for the US theater um, in English. Uh, this, by the way, this uh, image is uh, Ikram at the um, tomb of Ruti Jinnah, the first first lady of Pakistan, whose life was more or less stolen from her by being a very, very young bride to a much, much older Ali Jinnah, the um, so-called founding father of Pakistan. Um, Ikram uh, uh, received his bachelor's and master's degrees in political science and mass communications, uh, and then became a producer for Pakistan TV news, which he worked for for six years. Um, he reported on Pakistani army operations in Taliban occupied regions on the Marriott bombing on the Benazir Bhutto assassination, among other uh, things. As a lyric writer and poet developing at the same time while uh, being a news producer reporter, he was writing uh, poems in numerous languages um, and just some interesting side notes. He wrote song lyrics for Bollywood pop stars and a song tribute to Benazir Bhutto, uh, ben Benazir Bhutto I'm sorry, which uh, is now the theme for the Pakistan People's Party. Um, he studied screenwriting in India before coming to the US and then through a, a series of personal uh, experiences that could only have happened in the age of social media ended up in Iowa City, not to go to the Iowa Playwrights Workshop, but um, for other reasons. Uh, he then decided to apply to the workshop and he's given me permission to quote from his personal statement in the application. By the time I was 27, I had seen too much death and I was weary of news. When events were not too horrible to retell, news stories were often hyperbolic and unnecessarily alarming. More than ever, I wanted to do work that served truth in the highest sense of that word, and I turned my attention to storytelling. 
He's written three plays while uh, with us. We All Were Sunflowers, A Village in Asia, and The Job. We All Were Sunflowers is uh, inspired by uh, uh, the massacre, which you may be familiar with from the uh, movie Gandhi, of um, uh, uh, civilians at Jallianwala Bagh uh, under uh, British rule in 1919. Shahid Singh was a Pakistani who was present at that massacre and who devoted his life to seeking revenge on the British colonel who uh, ordered that massacre. A Village in Asia, which tells the story of uh, a case of child rape and murder, which is an act based on an actual case, and the question of justice that the village, which is actively involved in uh, arrest and um, uh, uh, the arrest and uh, persecute prosecution of the perpetrators has to face. The job, looks like I'm running out of time. Is this true, Brian? Uh, autobiographical one person play about his own abduction by the Taliban as a news reporter. Um, the one thing I wanted to say is that these are the realistic core stories of the plays, um, but uh, all of them have a larger poetic and theatrical exploration of their subject matter that revolve around those core stories and they combine his poetic instincts with a, his developing dramatic sense. Um, by the way, he writes in Urdu and translates his own writing into English and he is just beginning to experiment with writing directly in English. Um, he is uh, among our students, the least connected to sort of the business of the profession uh, as he figures out this world that we live in, um, uh, in the American theater. So he doesn't have a website among other things, but you can contact him directly at his email address. All of this information is contained um, in um, a handout that is uh, on the uh, uh, conference site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art. All right. Our final presenter is Jacqueline Goldfinger. Jacqueline. Hello. My name is Jacqueline Goldfinger, and uh, she, they, and the original caretakers of the land I'm on, or the Lenape. I'm based in Philadelphia. I'm going to tell you today about three fantastic Philadelphia playwrights. In addition, uh, if you go to the conference hub and go down to Under the Radar, there is a uh, handout with 25 additional playwrights that you should know about from around the country. So I hope you will check that out as well. But right now, I'm going to tell you about three fantastic playwrights from Philadelphia. The first playwright I want to introduce you to is Iresa. She's a fantastic Philadelphia, South New Jersey playwright. She's currently studying in the MFA program in dramatic writing at NYU Tisch School for the Arts. But before she went off to pursue her degree, she had her first professional world premiere in Philadelphia, Good Cuban Girls, which was a stunning, heartfelt, bilingual play that looked at the generation uh, of a life of a lifespan in, in a Cuban family that lived in South Jersey. It was full to the rafters every night uh, because the word of mouth was so wonderful. And she was recognized by the Barrymores, our local awards, and won the best new play for the Broadway World Regional Awards in our area. In addition to being a stunning new writer, she is smart, she is thoughtful, she is funny. I often call her work Lauren Gunderson meets Kiara Agriahudes meets Irisa Ann Riley. Stephanie has an energy unlike any other artist I've ever met, and she infuses that energy both into her performing work and into her plays. Whether she's creating the character of a little lost sheep for a devised company ensemble work, or she's creating new characters 
for a text-based work like her play Esther Choi and the Fish That Drowned, which was supposed to be her first professional production this spring. Unfortunately, it got canceled because of COVID, but it has been rescheduled to world premiere in the spring of 2021 at Simpatico Theater in Philadelphia. And if you are around, I will get you a ticket. It's going to be a riot in all the best ways. I describe Stephanie's work as Sheila Callahan and Fournez have a baby that is way more accessible, but just as political. Stephanie will begin her studies to get an MFA in playwriting at Point Park University this fall. Erlena is an all around powerhouse of a theater artist. She's a multi hyphenate actor, director, producer, playwright. She has a passion for social justice theater and for taking theater to the people. I've seen her write work for communities and take it to the communities, whether that be a garden, a proscenium theater, a church basement, or another shared space. She is all about about activating the community through her art. She and her producing partner, Gabby Sanchez and Power Street Theater, which they co-founded in North Philly, um, also is deeply engaged in activist issues in the community. For example, they recently staged a 48 hour digital march to save the arts when arts funding was cut in our community. Erlena's work is very much Lynn Nottage meets Julia Cho um, and spectacularly magical on top of it all. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Jacqueline. They, that was great. I think I'm glad we were able to fix that uh, tech issue and it's great to see the video. Much um, appreciated. And no problem. And as, as Jacqueline mentioned, uh, she gifted us with a document that highlights 25 more playwrights under the radar. Um, so I, absolutely encourage you to go check out the hub and look at that document and see all the different, all the additional playwrights that are um, everywhere. <laughs> um, they're all over. Uh, so I, I absolutely encourage you to, to go check that out. Uh, I um, wanted to, uh, we have a few minutes left and um, I want to welcome um, everyone back and to see if you have any thoughts or conversations with each other. Um, uh, thoughts, you know, in regard to the presentations that you have all seen. Um, I also welcome any questions that may have come from Facebook or Twitter. Um, welcome those to come in. Um, I know we had a couple more specific questions that we've directed to the appropriate people, um, but um, any thoughts, comments, additional recommendations, et cetera, that people would like to share at this time with each other. Not at this point. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> it was, you know, it was, there were some great, there were some great um, presentations, some great playwrights. Um, I hope there are uh, playwrights that uh, maybe you all have learned about from each other, which is great. And I hope that our uh, attendees who are watching uh, through HowlRound have found um, some new playwrights to look out for. Um, as I mentioned, most if not all of these playwrights are on the New Play Exchange. Uh, so please um, definitely go and uh, check out the conference hub uh, to uh, get their names and uh, more information as is, as is listed, um, as well as uh, go to the New, exchange, new Play Exchange and um, go check that out as well. 
So I understand that my video clip didn't play, but no worries, you heard some music, um, but there is a link, one of the links on the one sheet that I left for you will take you to the 1820 website You just scroll down a little bit and you can play the video there. Right. It's Thank 31 you. seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna, appreciate that. I do have a question. Um, how are all of you finding your playwrights, your dramaturgs? I'm new. So how do you go about finding your new favorite playwright is my question. I, I'm a mentor for a number of programs. So I'm very lucky that I have an opportunity to read plays coming out of both high schools and colleges. So if you can volunteer as a mentor for the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, oh. as well as for the Paula Vogel uh, Playwriting Mentorship. Um, and there are probably some in your communities, but I find that by volunteering to mentor, I get a really broad lay of the land. And that list of 25 playwrights across the country to watch that I posted on the new play exchange, almost all of them came from the fact that I met them through different mentorships. Cool, thank you. I do that too. Any other questions? I just wanna give a plug for a new to... play exchange too, Susanna, you know, that when, yeah, when I'm teaching or I think that, um, that argument that's out there sometimes is like, oh, I don't know any plays about this subject. There are thousands of plays about that subject and writers you haven't heard of. And the new play exchange is always improving its search functions, right? Um, and it's how I found Ashley's work. Right, you um, mentioned And then that. I just great. reached out to her and you know got to know her that way. So I really encourage you to use new play exchange as a reading place, yeah. but also it's a great connecting place. And if you love somebody's work, tell them, you know, <laughs> no one's yes. going to say no to that kind of conversation. <laughs> I think, I think Agreed. also, um, uh, this is art. I think also the Kilroy's list has become a very, very important resource. Um, it has a lot of well-established playwrights on it, but it has a lot of playwrights who are early in their careers, who are just uh, getting known by producers, directors, dramaturgs, and, um, um, I don't think it has the same level of information. The list doesn't have the same level of information that the new play exchange has about the writers. Um, but um, I think there might be a way of using it to identify um, some writers who you might connect with. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly mention the Canadian equivalent of that list, which is the 49 list. It's kind of a similar, but all Canadian artists. Uh, mm -hmm female uh, identifying artists of color, yeah. The 49 list. Okay, great, thank you. Catherine. I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> great, well. And then I think uh, you'll find too, like once you start working with playwrights, word of mouth will, will spread. Um, you know, once you've worked with somebody, then they'll start recommending you to their friends as well. Thank you. We will continue to be a stronger um, field, a stronger um, world of, 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 of theater artists um, when we are able to share the people who we love um, and who are trying to do the work um, that needs to be um, shared and, and, and extend, you know, their messages and their stories need to be extended everywhere. So um, please, um, uh, for those of you who are thinking, hey, I have playwrights in mind, uh, we will plan to do this session again next year. Um, and we would love to get more new people uh, to um, share their playwrights uh, and to, um, to spread the word, um, whether it is uh, through the social media or through this kind of session, um, um, of this Playwrights Under the Radar session. So I encourage you to, um, to keep looking out there wherever your channels are um, and let people know about them and, um, and, con and continue to lift them up um, and, and support their work and encourage their work because they need to know, as, as, as was mentioned, let them know that you see them and, um, that, um, and let others have a chance to see them as well. So 
Um, I'm gonna wrap up because I know we are going to be heading to our next session soon. Um, please, um, our next session um, for our LMDA conference uh, is the uh, Digital Civic Dramaturgy or Dramaturging the Digital City. Um, it is hosted by Laronica Thomas. Uh, I encourage you all to please go and check that out. Uh, the links are on the, the, the link to the uh, session is in the conference hub. Um, and if you have yet to register for the LMDA conference, I strongly encourage you to do so. We still have quite a few sessions today and tomorrow um, that you can participate in, along with lots of asynchronous material that'll be available through the end of the month. Uh, I wanna thank you all again uh, for presenting and sharing your playwrights uh, with us. I wanna thank everyone uh, to, for, uh, per, uh, to, for attending um, and checking this out. Um, and we will have this available um, through the HowlRound and Facebook channels. Um, so please um, let other people know if they weren't able to attend, to come and uh, check it out later. So um, otherwise, Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Brian.